Good morning. Good morning. Yes. I uh, would like to request one of us to please lead in prayer and then uh, we can go straight into the lesson. Good morning. Would uh, anyone want to volunteer, please? Can I pray? Yeah, yeah, please. please. Okay. Father, we thank you and praise you for this wonderful morning which you have given to us, O God. We humble before, before you and we seek your face, O Father God, for your guidance, for your knowledge, and for your revelation, O God. We ask you prepare our heart, prepare your servant. Lord Master, we pray that every word which is going to come out from our mouth, let it be from your throne room, O Father. Let we, Lord Master, grow in the ministry of apostolic and prophetic, O God, Master, so that we can stand as a powerful testimony, O Lord Master, with full revelation and the knowledge of God. We surrender every 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 segment of this class, every topics of this class, we surrender to you. And we ask you cover everything under your blood. We seek your face and seek your grace, O God. All the glory, honor, and praises belongs to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Shri Kumar. Uh, and today I'll um, touch on uh, some new insights from the Old Testament. But before that, uh, uh, we will look at maybe a uh, summary of some of the things that we learned in the last class, which is yesterday. So we saw... Uh, in the Old Testament that uh, God continued to speak to his people. There were ways in which he spoke. We saw the use of the Urim, the Tumim, and the will of God was identified through the casting of lots. There were also prophets who were chosen by God. There were priests who uh, sometimes, you know, not to a large extent, but sometimes could uh, hear the direction that God was giving them. Uh, but, uh, so, you know, we, we saw the ways in which God spoke in the Old Testament. And uh, we also saw that the most important test of a prophetic word is to know whether that prophetic word is leading us towards God or taking us away from God. So, uh, you know, that is the most important test. Uh, then, of course, there is the accuracy of the word and whether it conforms to the person of God, you know, the nature of God uh, and the revealed will of God. So we saw that that is what we must consider uh, regarding a prophetic word. And then we saw the connection of music to the prophetic anointing, that music uh, many a time can activate and cause the flow of the prophetic anointing. We also saw that the prophetic ministry in the Old Testament is associated with supernatural demonstrations of God's power. And that encourages us because as we consider the prophetic today, uh, we serve the same God. You know, the God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. And he is also, you know, the, the God who is with us in the time zone that we live in. And uh, he hasn't changed. If the supernatural and uh, uh, mind you looking at the old testament the kind of things that happened through the ministry of moses you know, when he was leading the people out of egypt uh, amazing miracles you know the sea parting and uh, thousands of people being led unharmed so many wonderful things god did elijah elisha you know calling a fire down from from heaven, uh, raising up supernaturally, you know, a, a dead child, then uh, bones raising up a dead person, axe floating in the water. So you, know, you could just go on and on and look at the the dramatic ways in which God's power was displayed, and nothing really stops God from doing the same today. And if we uh, plug into the prophetic anointing. Even today, we can expect amazing things to happen, miraculous things to happen. And uh, that is not separate from the prophetic anointing. Then we saw how the school of the prophets okay, is something that uh, we see in the Old uh, Testament and most likely set up by the prophet Samuel because the days that he lived in, uh, there was a dearth 
of the prophetic word uh, people were not hearing the voice of god and so he out of his experience and desire uh, encouraged those who had the grace the prophetic grace and it is likely that in these schools you had uh, prophets gather around a senior prophet and be trained they learn from the life and the uh, experience of the senior prophet so that's how the school of the prophets work uh, we uh, know that there is also an association uh, of the prophetic to uh, association uh, an influence of the prophetic where we can see that the anointing is operational uh, if we are connected to an environment where the prophetic is recognized, the prophetic is encouraged, the prophetic is desired. So if we uh, are somehow part of such an influence, such a, an environment, we can also see the prophetic being activated in our lives. So we talked about the prophetic influence yesterday. So this is where we actually stopped. And today we will continue from uh, there. So I am right now on page 37 in our notes. Uh, and you could please turn to that page and follow along. All right. Yeah. So today we will talk about the transfer of the prophetic anointing. Now, uh, we have discussed how uh, Moses, when he was burnt out, taking care of God's people, he um, really, you know, came to uh, the end of the rope and he was even ready to die. He said things like, God, I can't bear the burden of caring for people so you know kill me you know he came to that uh, uh, level um, of um, desperation in in his uh, ministry and at that point you know god uh, granted him the wisdom to know that he need not do everything that he could have people leaders under him who can lead with the kind of anointing that he already carried so we saw yesterday in the book of Numbers, chapter 11, uh, uh, Moses selects 70 leaders and he calls them so that he can commission them. But then when he does call these people, two of them are left somewhere in the camp. Uh, but even then, you know, when he uh, commissions them and uh, he wa he uh, asks for the anointing on his life to rest on all of these 70 people so that they can also lead uh, God's people well, um, you know, the, the people in the camp begin to prophesy. Okay, so this is very interesting. So this is an example of the transfer of the anointing. So there is an anointing on the life of Moses. What kind of an anointing is this? There, there are multiple anointings. See, anointing is the empowering of God. Okay, we just use this technical term called anointing. Um, and also, uh, now that we have the Holy Spirit with us, we know that, you know, he... Uh, serves as the anointing of God over our lives. Okay, So uh, when we say anointing, you know, it's, it's not like, oh, wow, what is that? Uh, uh, sometimes we just got, get caught up in, in the technicality of it. But that's what we mean when we say anointing. Okay? Anointing is the empowering grace of God. Uh, so Moses had the anointing for leadership. He had the anointing as a prophet. All right. So uh, these were the primary anointings that you would see in his life. But, you know, there were other things as well that he was capable of doing. And that was God's empowering granted to Moses. Now, when he wanted to send out these um, 70 people to take care of um, the children of Israel, the anointing was transferred on them. Okay, what anointing was transferred? This is also a very important question to ask. So the 70 did not become, uh, you know, junior Moses. They didn't because uh, all of what Moses had did not get transferred onto them. So we can say that some extent of the leadership anointing, a part of what was on Moses was released to these 70 people. And, you know, we also saw how uh, the 
the prophetic anointing on Moses. You know, part of that also uh, probably was released to them because you saw those two men in the camp. They were prophesying. Okay. So this is a wonderful example of how Moses decided to get uh, the team to discharge leadership responsibilities through the transfer of the anointing. So even today, you know, we have this practice when there is a leader who is uh, appointed in the church, uh, the, the people over him or her, they would pray. When they pray, you know, many things happen. God's blessing comes upon uh, the individuals. But also, you know, we who believe in the working of the Holy Spirit, we also understand that there can be a transfer of an anointing. Okay, so anointing can get transferred. So that is the point that we are trying to make here. Okay, another classic example for us is the lives of Elijah and Elisha. We've already seen that the school of the prophets was a popular concept in these days, and so junior prophets would um, even live with the senior prophets like servants so that they can receive from the life of the senior prophet. So Elisha in that manner was after Elijah. And um, uh, if you would try to look at it in a deeper way, Elisha was not just after Elijah. He was after the anointing on Elijah's life. So uh, Elisha is following after um, uh, Elijah. And what was Elisha's request? Okay, So Elisha's request was he wanted a double portion of the anointing on Elijah's life. Now, if you study the life of Elijah, it's, it's thrilling. It's, it's like, wow, if we lived in those times and saw the kind of uh, miracles that uh, Elijah walked in, we would we would be fascinated by it uh, and even beyond that you know since elisha recognized that he had a calling in the same area the prophetic ministry he obviously placed a desire on what he already saw and his request to elijah was i want a double anointing whatever you have done i want to do double of it you know, that's a very noble uh, desire. And uh, sometimes I wonder, you know, when we see God working, we see God's power working, God's anointing working in various ways around us in the global body of Christ, do we place a desire on the good and genuine things that we see? And, you know, based on the grace that we carry upon our lives, do we say that, oh, God, wow, if so-and-so uh, is, is moving like this uh, in, in the anointing, Lord, whatever grace you have given me, can you increase it over my life? So Elisha is one who has a noble desire. He wants a double portion of what he saw. Now, of course, you know, there are other aspects to the anointing. You know, you, you have to be obedient, pay the price, uh, because you notice here that if it was as easy as one individual or human being giving away a portion of their anointing, uh, we could all be giving and taking anointing. And, you know, better still, uh, if double portion of the anointing Elijah could give Elisha, wouldn't he lay his hands on his head and give himself the double portion of the anointing? He would. And even we would, you know, multiply the anointing over our lives every day if it was just uh, about laying hands and praying. But Elijah understood that this is not how the anointing is transferred. It's only God who gives the anointing. A human being cannot give another human being anointing because anointing does not belong to us. We don't we don't have it uh, in, in the sense that, you know, originally we are not the source of the anointing. So uh, here's what Elijah told Elisha. Look, if you uh, follow me closely uh, and if you see me being taken away, then you will have it. You will have the double portion of the anointing. So it was really a test of Elisha's focus. Now, how badly do you want the anointing on Elijah's life? So 
Elisha was chasing after Elijah. And, you know, initially, I don't know if Elijah wondered, why is this guy behind me? Uh, but I'm sure Elijah understood. He's not after me. He's after the anointing on my life. So Elisha is following Elijah around everywhere. In other words, basically focus, okay, laser sharp focus. So he's going with Elijah, his mentor from Gilgal to Bethel to Jericho, uh, across the Jordan. And, you know, then it happens. He notices or he sees Elijah being caught up in the chariots of fire. And the anointing comes upon Elisha's life because uh, he fulfilled the criteria, which is to see Elijah being taken away. And then when we study about the life of Elisha, uh, the Bible is very interesting. Okay, You list out the number of miracles that Elijah did. List out the number of miracles that Elisha did. It's exactly double. You know, God is true to his word. Uh, and that's what you see. Because Elisha was so focused on the anointing and getting more of the anointing. He never got distracted. Even when Elijah instructed him and said, if you see me being taken away. You know, Elisha could have been distracted by the chariots of fire, the supernatural demonstration, you know, in the way uh, in which Elisha was taken away. But no, Elisha's focus was, I just have to see Elijah if I, if I make sure you know, I do this, I will have double the anointing. So, you know, that's a beautiful thing that he understood that the anointing is transferable. So uh, the anointing, this is like earlier we saw Moses and a part of the anointing being transferred. Now, double. So can anointing be transferred? Answer is yes. Can a part of the anointing be transferred? Answer is yes. Can more of the anointing be transferred? The answer is yes. Okay. So we see the dynamics of the, the prophetic anointing in the Old Testament. And all of this gives us a lot of hope that, you know, we can desire these things because uh, nowhere in the Bible do you see that it has come to an end. No, it hasn't. So if we place a desire on the anointing and we go after the anointing, you know, again, we can't give it to one another. We can't grab it. A life of, you know, focus, a life of obedience, a life of, you know, sincerity um, towards God. It can draw the anointing on our lives. So, uh, you know, we, we can do that. Okay, let's now continue further. When we come to the New Testament, we read in Luke one seventeen. This is a description of John the Baptist. John the Baptist. And it says that he came in the spirit and the power of Elijah. So what are we studying about now? We're studying about the transfer of the anointing. We've already looked at a couple of things. The point here is you have a man called John who lived way uh, centuries after a powerful prophet Elijah. But the Bible says that John carried the spirit and the power of Elijah. So the conclusion that we draw is anointing can be transferred across generations. Okay, So there can be somebody in the past who moved in a certain way okay, with, with a certain anointing. And today you and I, you know, again, depending on it's not by our choice. You know, God, the, the, the grace is given by God. The grace is given by God. But of course, you know, we can also desire. And sometimes when we desire, that's an indication that there is a grace in that area. So we can have those anointings. You know, we talk about people like Smith Wigglesworth, uh, uh, who saw many miracles in, in his ministry, even you know, people being raised from the dead. We talk about, you know, uh, ministers and the healing um, healing revivals, uh, Maria Woodworth Etter and Amy Semple McPherson. You know, we talk about all these people and the anointings over their lives. A. Allen, the miraculous, okay? the miraculous was demonstrated through their lives. Now, whenever we read things like this, don't get attached to the people. 
yeah we honor the people associated with what god did but when we begin to desire the anointing on their lives okay who is to say that it cannot be sent on our lives today and you know we uh, do uh, as much or maybe even more than what they have done in their generation so the point of understanding that john the baptist carried the anointing of elijah was that anointing can be transferred across generations okay and so we can desire it and also notice here you would look at the life of john the baptist and uh, try to compare it with elijah's life and and wonder what what is this elijah's anointing but where is john uh, you know he didn't part the jordan river he did nothing that is you know that can be called as a supernatural demonstration of god but you see we read about elijah that you know through the anointing over his life um all these miracles happen but john uh, is the one through elijah's anointing what he could do is he could turn the hearts of the people back to the lord and prepare them for the lord so you know that part where people's hearts were being prepared for the lord that was the the specific thing that john the baptist was able to do through the anointing of elijah now this is another interesting lesson for us you know we can carry the anointing of somebody else of the past but it may not display itself the way it did in that person's life okay it could it could come through or flow in a completely different way and yet it can be the anointing of a certain individual either in scripture or you know somebody who has served the lord so this is also something we can um see in scripture that the anointing may not look exactly like even if you know the lord came spoke to you confirmed to you that hey you have the anointing of so and so you may not be a replica of that person you may be doing something completely different that a regular person can't tell that you're carrying the same anointing however the anointing will release what god intends through it okay so john the baptist through elijah's an anointing what was he able to do draw the hearts of the people towards god he didn't do you know all those supernatural uh, miracles so that is about the transferring of the anointing so always remember anointing is from god you know we can't give and take uh, anointing it's god who calls he appoints he anoints and uh, uh, what human beings can do is we can train we can also there's a terminology called impart meaning by through prayer through um, uh, you know our our uh, desire uh, we can actually release whatever's on our my life i can release it over somebody else's life because scriptures talk about it you can impart okay to others so uh, impartation is possible uh, and activate we can activate people in the uh, prophetic or any other kind of anointing but the source is god and uh, none of us can claim to uh, be the source of anointing okay so uh, that's a little bit more about the prophetic anointing okay i'm just looking at uh, chat here if there are any issues okay abraham are you on the call with us were you is there a problem with the link yes please but i'm here now i have to use the old link oh yes yes oh so the the one that i have posted didn't work for you no it didn't work i think that's why many people joined late oh i'm so sorry i'm not too sure what happened yeah Okay, yeah, the, even me, even me, I struggled. I had to use another link that Mangi gave us. I know. I'm so sorry, everyone. I I think uh, it didn't paste what I was trying to put even out. Even me, it was hard to communicate. It was hard to yeah. read that. Okay, yeah. I'm I'm just reposting. Uh, let me do that in case some students are still stuck outside the class.
I don't know if you notice, but uh, somehow in this class, I'm getting the same code every time. So even if you clicked on an older link, you you would still get into the class. Yeah, it's always giving me the same code. Okay, I really hope others didn't miss this class. Let's see, I've posted and uh, yeah, okay, Elisha has joined. Okay, let's see. Yeah, we'll have uh, students joining in. Uh, all right, so uh, I'll quickly take some questions. Uh, and then we will move forward. Hopefully, in, in that time, people will join. So answering uh, the question of Kennedy, Kennedy asked yesterday, major profits, minor profits. So Kennedy, um, the reason behind uh, these words is just the length of um, you know the books, the prophetic books. Uh, so it's not that you know somebody is, has a more important message than another person but if you uh, take the list of the major prophets and compare it with uh, the the books that are mentioned as minor prophets it's just the length of the books so that's all okay and i hope you got the answer to your question uh, shri kumar i can see your hand raised uh, please go ahead yeah thank you pastor yeah no yeah pastor uh, my question is um, as you said um, like, um, you know, Elijah imparted his anointing to the Elisha. Um, and, uh, and um, you know, even he, he, he got that, um, um, you know, the, what he desired to, the, what he desired, what he asked that he needs that double portion. And, um, but uh, what was the reason that uh, he couldn't able to manifest it completely? Because even though he, he received what he wanted, but uh, unfortunately he died with sickness. And uh, but that uh, anointing was still there in his bones. Later we can find that um, because of uh, you know the bone, a man got resurrected. So what was the reason that um, even though Elisha received that anointing, and um, and um, and uh, you know he missed that uh, you know the the biggest biggest thing what elijah did like uh, no he was actually in car, like um, he was just moved transported to heaven like how the enoch was transferred why he missed that one thing and uh, even though i believe that he had that anointing because if that was the reason that bone carried that anointing and uh, a dead man was raised so i just want to know this uh, why that could, why that happened at or uh, is it possible that even though we have anointing and we can miss something in our life. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah, yeah excellent uh, question there, Shri Kumar. Um, and you know, uh, what you shared just now should really make us think and understand that at the end of the day, we are human beings, we are mortal beings, we are created beings. Yes, there is anointing on our lives, but it doesn't make us in control of everything. Okay, now, uh, the answer why why didn't Elisha get caught up like Elijah? And why did Elisha die? Uh, there can be many uh, reasons for that. And it could have to do with, uh, I don't know. I mean, we can just speculate based on what we know from scripture. You know, is there, um, uh, maybe he didn't understand something uh, uh, about, you know, how God worked or, uh, you know, maybe there was some disobedience or we don't know, right? So we really don't know. That's the, that's the bottom line. Um, and also remember that carrying anointing, even the prophetic anointing, that is not a replacement of a walk with God you know, as a child of God, as a believer, a walk of obedience. Okay. So we can't, public ministry is another, it's a totally different chapter in our lives. But just because there is that chapter doesn't mean that, you know, our, our dependency on God uh, as a child, you know, that, that, that chapter doesn't exist. That also exists. Okay. And many times, even when you study the lives of men and women of God, it's surprising. It's surprising how the same people who were pressing into a certain anointing in their own lives, they were struggling 
to apply that okay maybe they would go pray for another person and see that happen for example i think even smith wigglesworth he raised so many people from the dead but when it came um, to raising his own wife from the dead he couldn't so it was not him doing it he could, see the anointing is flowing out of our lives that doesn't mean we control the anointing isn't it similarly you, know, you study the life of john g lake when he began so many of his family members died and in one way that was the trigger for him to pursue the the healing anointing because he wanted to see that manifest in people's lives after doing that he goes to south africa over there all these wonderful things take place and then you know you notice that his wife becomes very sick and she dies so you see the point uh, i'm trying to make is just because an anointing flows you know through our ministry doesn't mean that we are in control of everything uh, we have to come to a place in our lives where we say god you know i'm just a vessel uh you know i'm a i'm i'm a mortal uh, obedient committed vessel sometimes why the anointing didn't work like this or like that we can't even explain it we don't have the answers we really don't so um i'm still leaving you uh in in a state of you know it's thank, yeah thank you, but i hope it makes sense what thank i'm you, saying no thank you yeah okay thank you thank you yes uh, abraham please go ahead yes pastor yeah pastor please with regards to um the double anointing mm. there is other school of thought that says that um elijah could not give double of what he doesn't have it means that if i cannot give you double of what i don't have i can only give what i have and um what they meant by double was um that elisha was made the first born in other words elisha replaced elijah in his calling mm -hmm. and they also brought an argument that the fact that elisha did more miracle doesn't mean he was more anointed than elijah also referring to John the Baptist. So, how do we balance this? Okay, yeah, Abraham, I'll tell you, uh, you know, my understanding. See, it's quite clear that uh, Elisha did double the number of uh, miracles than Eli Elijah. So, for us to say that he didn't move in the double portion, uh, I don't know how correct that statement would be because it's very obvious that there is a double performance uh, by elisha and uh, we also know that that's probably because of what he asked elijah earlier so in my mind it settled that he asked for a double anointing he got it he moved in it now coming back to the first question you said um, elijah said that i can't give you what i don't have okay so it doesn't mean that Elijah is not flowing in the anointing. Basically, what he's saying is, I'm not the source. If you, if any human being wants to get anointing, you have to ask God. Don't ask me because I'm not the source. So that would be the interpretation. And I hope it answers your questions. Yes, yes. But the one that confuses me is the fact that John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah and not Elisha. You know, and another yeah. thing is that even though he came in the fullness of that anointing, his yeah. manifestation, he did not do any miracle. So again, uh, you see, it's very complicated when I want to think about it. That's why I'm asking. First yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, Abraham, a uh, good point there. You said John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah and not Elisha. Uh, the way we can understand this is, see, God honors the fathers. You know, you could put it that way. So Elijah is like the forerunner of this kind of a prophetic, miraculous anointing. Uh, so, yeah, God honored Elijah, even though there was an Elisha and, you know, maybe several others who moved in the prophetic anointing. Their names were not mentioned, but Elijah's name was mentioned. So God honors the fathers. Okay, so that and... Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Master. Sure, sure. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Shrikumar, I'll come back to you. You have a question? Yes, Pastor. Uh, Pastor, can I ask? Yes, please. Thank you. 
Pastor, uh, in that case, then uh, sorry, in that case, how can we say that uh, you know the number of miracles uh, is something which represents there is a more anointing? If we say that um, you know Jesus Himself said that uh, you can do, you will do greater things, then uh, it means that do we have greater anointing than Jesus, or um, the or how can we come to a conclusion where we say that uh, the numbers numbers of miracles will determine that uh, he is more anointed and uh, he is less anointed? As you said that the uh, major prophet and minor prophet, that uh, you know it's because of the the length of the books. So it's but they are all common. But in the same way, uh, how can we come to a conclusion where we say that because he did numbers of because we are counting the numbers because uh, I don't know whether I'm right or wrong. But uh, how can we measure the uh, the anointing and say that uh, you know uh, because of the numbers of miracles uh, which is recorded in the Bible? In that way, we are categorizing that uh, you know El Elisha uh, you know Elisha had that level of anointing and related to that only I asked that question that in that in that case if he, he did number of uh, miracles so many number of miracles uh, uh, more than more than Elijah but why then why he couldn't able to uh, you know uh, miss that one thing what Elijah did thank you Pastor. okay thank you Sri Kumar see uh, uh measuring of the anointing okay, that's also not um it's not a simple thing and uh, as you rightly pointed out by the number of miracles by the accomplishment of public ministry you can't we can't really tell you know who was more anointed than somebody else but see the bible is just trying to establish that god kept his word and uh, elijah ended up receiving what he desired so it's just that it's just making that one simple statement uh, in the number of miracles that Elisha did. Okay, But we don't take the number of miracles from there as a precedent to measure the anointings of everyone else in the Bible. Okay, So uh, that is one thing. The second thing is, yes, Elisha missed it. So why did he miss it? I don't have the answer to that question. But what can we learn from this? See, we need to pursue the Lord with obedience in our lives. Now coming to, I'm just using uh, uh, healing, okay, healing anointing. Don't want to digress from the prophetic, but healing anointing. Let's say, you know, uh, I pray for people and everyone is healed immediately. They are healed. The healing power is flowing. But I find out that I'm sick. Okay. What is the general way in which you know, common way by which God brings healing to our bodies through the meditation, you know, in, in his word. So for me, I, I might pray a couple of times and I might feel that, hey, it's gone. But then the general way in which I will pursue my healing is I will spend time in God's word. You know, I will do everything that I need to do as a person, as a believer to walk in divine health. Okay, so just because... Uh, the anointing is not, uh, I don't see it being uh, working the way it's working in the people's lives when I pray for them. Um, you know, I shouldn't, I shouldn't get discouraged by that. But I follow what the Bible says. Okay, I go by the word, I go by the truth that Jesus has already paid the price for my healing. I trust him, I pray, I do everything else. So that would be, so it's more a learning, Sri Kumar. Why did Elisha not have it or do it? I don't know. But what I can learn from it is that uh, anointing and ministry capabilities do not replace the need for uh, an obedient life before the Lord. Yeah. Thank you, Master. Yeah, sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, Sister Rupa has a comment here. She says, according to our purpose, Holy Spirit, God grants us the anointing to accomplish it. Yes, that's right. That's right. So he will equip us based on what we need to do. Kennedy uh, says, um, okay, thanks. Is there a preferred chronology of prophecy given that it's a public ministry? Uh, okay, Kennedy, I'm not too sure what you mean by this. Uh, if you could tell me, we'll address it quickly and then move forward. I hope I'm audible. Yes, yes, because please. I've, I've read the book of uh, Jeremiah. And at the 
commentary part, it's called, there's a lot of commentary saying that it's, it's more disorganized, unlike the other prophecies. It's not orderly. So I don't know whether it was captured when they were doing this. There was there any preferred chronology of writing this book of the, of the prophecies, or the, or the way the prophecies are done, because it's a public ministry. So there ought to be some kind of order. Okay, you. so you mean to say in the way the prophecies were given, it wasn't chronological? Yeah, is there, is there a preferred chronology? Mm, preferred chronology, I I don't, I, I, there, there is, you know, when you study these books based on the timelines, I think you will, you will get the chronology. We will understand the chronology, but in the books, uh, to have to see a certain order, it completely depends on the author of the book. So some books are very well organized, systematic. Some are not. Uh, but I think you can you can compare it to the timelines uh, in history and study. Then you'll get a better picture of when the prophet was speaking this and to whom and how does that apply. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank okay. You. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, everyone. So we'll try to cover a little more ground today. Uh, so we've understood about the transfer of the anointing. Now, uh, in the Old Testament, we also see that the prophetic ministry um, was geared to towards helping leaders and rulers. So you have uh, prophets who work closely with kings. Uh, Prophet Samuel is a wonderful example. He anointed Saul and later anointed David. And uh, he was there initially for David. But eventually, you know, you read uh, of prophets like Nathan and Gad and uh, Heman and Jedithan. These are all, these were called, these men were called as the king's seers or uh, prophets who would inquire of the Lord and who would uh, give God's direction to David. So they were bringing direction, they were bringing correction, so on and so forth. So what we understand is that uh, the prophetic can be a huge blessing to leadership. So today we don't have kings, uh, uh, you know, in most of the nations, but you may have people uh, who are elected into the, the parliament. Any place, any position of leadership, you know, the prophetic anointing, the prophetic ministry can be a blessing. It can be a blessing to leadership. And that uh, that is what we take away from it. So whether they are political leaders, marketplace leaders, the, there can be a positive influence of the prophetic ministry uh, upon the work that they do. Now, let's uh, go to the next section here, which is about demonic opposition to prophetic ministry. Uh, you know, whenever there is something good in the kingdom of God, we tend to see a counterfeit of the same in the kingdom of darkness because Satan tries to compete. Okay, He wants to create something similar and um, distract people. So the prophetic has the counterfeit uh, in the demonic, which are things like witchcraft divination, uh, future telling, you know, things like this also uh, are seen and people might get confused and ask questions and say, hey, uh, you're telling us that it's only God who can reveal the future and the secret things. But you have people who are connected to the occult who also uh, seem to know uh, and, and uh, function in the miraculous. How do you explain this? So a good example is to go back to the time when Moses went to meet Pharaoh to let God's people go. If you recall, you know he did all these miracles with his rod. There were the sorcerers of Pharaoh as well, you know, who uh, had snakes. Uh, they created snakes. And then finally, uh, and Moses and Aaron, they were challenged. But in the end, the snake, which was formed by the rod of Moses, um, you know, ate up the snakes of the sorcerers. So the lesson is that, yes, the demonic can also present the miraculous. 
okay uh, however we know that at the end of the day it is god and his power that will prevail so even in this incident towards the end uh, the powers of the sorcerers were no match to the power of god and if you can recall the things that happened in egypt the plagues you know the the magicians uh, the people connected to uh, the occult they couldn't do anything uh, and the pharaoh came to a place where he was like i just bow down to the power of this god y'all go just go pack your bags leave because his magicians could do nothing so ultimately even if there are counterfeit um, uh, you know activities uh, of of uh, satan they are no match to the power of god now in the old testament you know talking about the the demonic realm and uh, the prophetic anointing jezebel is another uh, person who was challenging the anointing the prophetic anointing especially the prophetic anointing on elijah's life okay so who is jezebel you know jezebel is ahab's wife we know that both of them were very wicked uh, rulers but it wasn't the the woman herself but because she had all these magicians and uh, you know connected so much to the occult she was operating by what is generally termed as the spirit of jezebel okay the spirit of jezebel so what does the spirit of jezebel do the spirit of jezebel is involved in things like uh, witchcraft lying deceiving seducing controlling manipulating so these are the activities of the jezebel spirit okay and that these spirits were working through the life of this woman called jezebel and they were challenging the prophetic anointing over elijah's life so the point is that whenever there is the real power of god would we see a challenge from the demonic yes we notice that moses the prophet was challenged elijah was challenged okay and not really the people but the anointing on their lives was challenged but we know that you know god encouraged elijah uh, the 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 challenge and the tension was so real the opposition was so real and it was a spiritual opposition you see and elijah ran for his life he hid uh, he came to a place where he even wanted to quit because the demonic was putting that kind of pressure uh, on him but god strengthened him you know god brought him out of that uh, and uh, god you know caused him to continue in his ministry he decided to continue in his ministry so uh, we see that the demonic will challenge but you know god's power always overcomes the power of the enemy and i think we are uh, short of time again and we have to stop right here two more minutes to go uh, but i hope you all are gaining something from this um, and um, we will cover there are so many insights isn't it just by looking at the incidents in the old testament we are able to learn so much about the prophetic anointing so we will study some more um, get some more understanding from the old testament and then move on, move on to the new testament so each time we do this you know, we can build our uh, knowledge about the prophetic anointing okay so with that i think we will need to wrap up the class if you have a quick question we can accommodate that but if not we will pray and we will stop for today uh any any questions or thoughts okay so if there aren't then let's pray and close uh, i would like to request someone to please lead in prayer Okay, Abraham, could you please pray and close? Yes, Pastor. Yes, yeah. Pastor. Let's thank pray. you. Precious Father, we thank you for this very moment. Father, we are grateful for all that you've taught us today. Father, even as we are learning about the prophetic anointing, 
Father, we pray for the grace to prophesy, the grace to know your thoughts, the grace to know what you are saying to the church and to our individual lives. Father, we pray that we are not going to be hearers only, but we are going to be doers of this word. That you give us the ability to practice working with you, working in you, and, work, and working for you. Father, we pray for everyone in this meeting that that grace that you gave this apostles, that the grace that you give to this prophet, you give us that same grace, that in these end times we will manifest your glory, your presence and your power in the name of the Lord Jesus. Father, we thank you for what you are doing and what you are going to do with us in this generation. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. 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 Thank you, Abraham. Thank you, everyone. God bless you. Have a good day. We'll meet again next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. God bless. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you, sister. Thank you, Hope. Bye.